Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Energy Transition in China, Technology, Policy, and Society. We are grateful to Dr. Lin Zhang from the City University of Hong Kong for today's timely discussion and our distinguished panelists. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iae.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for our panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our, our moderator, Dr. Lin Zhang, Assistant Professor in the School of Energy and Environment at the City University of Hong Kong. Dr. Lin, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Good morning or good evening, everybody depends on uh, where you live. Welcome to today's webinar. So my name is Lin Zhang, Assistant Professor at City University of Hong Kong. Uh, my research work covers topics related to sustainable energy economics with a particular interest in developing new quantitative methods to evaluate the effective effectiveness of various energy policies at the local, regional, and global level. So today, we are pleasure to uh, invite three speakers to share their research on the topic related to energy transition in China. Actually, uh, Tuesday of this week, Chinese President Xi has made a very remarkable speech as the general debate of the 75th sessions of the United Nations General Assembly. He says that China is willing to contribute more to the fight against climate change. That is aims to bring carbon emissions to a peak by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 20, 2060 with more forceful policies and measures. He pointed out that one of the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic is that humanity must pursue the green development path and the green lifestyle. So I believe today's webinar will be a very interesting and timely discussion. The three speakers will share their thoughts first and we will have a Q&A session at the very end of the webinar for you to ask questions. So please allow me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lucy Chu. Lucy is an associate professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Her research focuses on using big data with quasi-experimental and experimental methods to answer empirical questions related to the interactions among consumer behavior, energy technologies, and incentives. So as I know, uh, she just published two uh, very good papers in Nature Energy. Congratulations, Lucy. And today, Lucy will discuss how the project of distributed photovoltaic poverty alleviation and nationwide energy saving big campaign drive energy transition from the demand side. Now let's listen to Lucy. Great, thank you Dr. Zhang for the nice introduction and thanks for uh, IEE for pro providing this platform for us to share our research. All right, so hi everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the seminar. Uh, as uh, Dr. Zhang mentioned, I will uh, discuss two uh, related but separate topics. Uh, my first topic is to look at the, uh, the, how uh, PV photovoltaic development can coexist with uh, rural poverty alleviation. And this uh, first topic is based on results which we uh, recently uh, published at Nature Communications with a joint collaboration with uh, Professor Hui Ming Zhang from Nanjing University of Information Science and Technology. All right, so I first want to give you a background about uh, this program that's called the Solar Energy for Poverty Alleviation Program. It started in uh, 1930, uh, 2013 when China uh, started to implement a large scale initiative to systematically deploy solar photovoltaic projects to alleviate poverty in rural areas. And then this program called a CPAC, a CPAC in China aims to add over 10 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2020. And this program 
supports solar installations in high poverty rural village through two types of projects. The first one is village level arrays, uh, typically on the magnitude of hundreds or thousands of kilowatt in capacity. And the second type of project are rooftop uh, uh, solar panels installed uh, towards poor villagers. And these are typically at the magnitude of several kilowatt hours per system. All right, so now this uh, next I want to discuss why solar PV project can help alleviate uh, uh, rural poverty. And here uh, we're showing you a diagram that shows the uh, mechanisms of the poverty alleviation. So, and the first uh, to give you an uh, idea, the CPAC solar projects are basically very similar to the community solar programs and other jointly owned renewable energy generation projects, which you might already be very familiar with in the US, Europe, and other regions. Okay, so now on the diagram, so this is how uh, the CPAP uh, program works. So first the government provide funding towards uh, both the uh, grid company and also towards the uh, company that uh, construct the uh, PV power station. And then so two types of subsidies, and then the grid company also directly purchased the electricity generated from the power station. And then uh, the revenue collected from the solar PV power uh, uh, station or those projects can be directly distributed to the uh, poor villagers at a predetermined uh, share uh, negotiated with the uh, power station or the project owners. So that's one direct impact of the solar PV projects on poverty alleviation. That's basically a direct uh, additional income. And there's also the second secondary or indirect impact is that uh, such solar PV projects can better facilitate the local access to knowledge information, which will translate into better income opportunities. For example, they might know more about PV projects or might know more about power uh, electricity so that they can find potentially increase their job skill in these sectors. And in addition, these local PV projects can create more uh, local, uh, new and more business, uh, such as those business related to the supply chain or operations related to the solar projects. And all these can translate into indirect uh, effect on the P uh, poverty alleviation. All right, so those are the mechanisms. And then in this paper, our key contribution is to provide empirical evidence about whether this program actually worked or not. And then we date, the data we collected uh, was, a, uh, was a panel data set uh, at annual level of 211 pilot counties that received the targeted PV investments from this policy uh, during 2013 and 2016 time period. And then here on this map, you can show uh, the distribution of uh, at, the, at the provincial level, the counties selected for the PV poverty allevi alleviation uh, policy in China. And then these shaded uh, provinces are those that are uh, heavily, uh, have heavily concentrated uh, counties that are in this program. Now in terms of methodology, uh, we basically for each county that are uh, selected in this uh, program, we find a control city, a control county that is very similar to the uh, county that is in the solar PV uh, poverty alleviation program uh, in terms of, for example, GDP or education level but except for that they are not receiving any uh, uh, subsidies or direct PV investments from the program. And then uh, we use the difference in difference to estimate the causal impact of such policy on uh, rural per capita income at the county level. All right, so here are the results. Uh, this figure basically shows the results of the event study. And then here are these dots are measuring the difference of the rural income between the counties that are in the PV poverty alleviation program and the, con and the similar counties that are not in the program. And then here, this X axis shows the number of years relative to the year when the program started. For example, prior to the program started, for example, when it's one year before, two year before, three year before, the difference between the uh, solar PV poverty counties and the control counties are not significantly different. That means that these two type of counties uh, share similar parallel trend in terms of the rural per capita income prior to the start of the program. And then after the start of the PV poverty elevation program, then you can see a very significant increase in the income of the counties that are receiving PV investments uh, from such program. Okay, so you know, to summarize, we find that the PV poverty elevation pilot county increases the per capita disposable income in a county 
by approximately 7% to 8%. All right, so the results look very promising that the uh, solar uh, renewable energy development and the uh, uh, poverty alleviation can coexist. However, there are some remaining challenges. Um, the cost of this program may actually create political challenges for the continuation of strong financial support from the government. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in this diagram, you can see that the government is basically sending money to the great company as well as sending money uh, to the project owners. Okay, and then uh, the estimates uh, suggest that such uh, subsidies uh, could be as high as 30 billion yuan or about 4.5 billion US dollar over five years. So one uh, key concern is that the policies, new policies should be developed now to enable a smooth transition toward a low uh, state support or at least state financial support. For example, there should be policies that are more focused on such uh, indirect mechanism can, which can spur the local economy and then uh, indirectly increase the uh, uh, rural per capita income in those villages. All right, so that's the uh, first topic. I, I know uh, due to the time constraint, I uh, went through this very quickly. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me during the Q&A. Then the next I want to switch to the topic on the demand side, uh, look at how the Chinese government are using a notch program to uh, aiming to influence the consumer electricity usage behavior. And this is a, a still a work in progress paper. Uh, it's a joint work with my PhD student, Xin Chi Shen, and, uh, and also Lin Luo from State Great Shanghai Electric Power Research Institute and Xia Hao Zhen, uh, which, who is the CEO from uh, a uh, power company. All right, so now uh, let me first give you some uh, background about social nudge and uh, energy research. Now, recently, academics and policymakers are interested in using nudges to alter consumer behaviors. Examples of nudges include uh, providing information, uh, social comparisons, and persuasion. And then also, it, uh, studies typically find that such uh, nudging mechanisms uh, are typically inexpensive to compare to price-based approaches as measured by a dollar per kilowatt hour sa uh, saving. Uh, here, this, this figure shows you an example of how such nudging program works. So this is an example where uh, the, uh, a company sends out the regular messages to households to compare their own electricity uh, use compared to their efficient neighbors uh, with the hope that that can create uh, peer pressure to uh, help these consumers alter their electricity consumption behavior. Now in this paper, we're looking at a different type of nudging program. Here we're looking at special environmental events as a specific form of nudges. And these three, uh, we're looking at three such environmental events that have been very popular in China and around the world. Uh, we're looking at Earth Hour, World Environmental Day, and National Energy Saving Publicity Week. Now, you, you probably are already very familiar with Earth Hour. It's organized by WWF, and it is a worldwide event, uh, which organizes a, a symbolic activity that switches off lights for one hour in order to encourage people to protect the environment and save energy. And then the second event we're looking at is the World Environmental Day, which happened on the 5th of June every year uh, for raising awareness on environmental issues and energy saving and so on. And then next, more importantly, we're looking at a chi China-specific uh, nudge program. It's called the National Energy Saving Publicity Week. And this, uh, this uh, week uh, or this event is held annually and co-organized by uh, 14 state level or national level uh, departments. And during that one week time period, the government uh, agencies will promote a unique promotional theme and slogan and carry out various activities across the country aiming to uh, enhance people's resource awareness, energy conservation awareness, and environmental protection awareness. All right, so for example, the, uh, the, the uh, week that we're looking at in the study uh, was from June 11th to 17th uh, in 2017. Now, all right, so in terms of data, we obtained the high frequency smart meter data from the State Grid Research Institute, and they cover both the commercial consumers and residential consumers. For commercial consumers, we obtained the panel data set uh, at hourly level from uh, 684 consumers, randomly drawn from their smart meter consumers uh, from 2017 to 2018 in Shanghai. And then similar for residential consumers, we obtained a larger sample of about 1,700 consumers. All right, so now in terms of method, uh, I'm, I'm going to just briefly mention it here. We use a two-step local linear method to control for confounding factors. 
So basically, we have a first stage. There's a panel regression controlling for, for example, consumer fixed effects, uh, a seasonal factor, weather, uh, temperature, as well as um, uh, other uh, fixed effects that can control for any factors that can influence all consumers at the same time. And then in the second stage, we obtain the residuals from the first stage panel regression and regress the residual on the uh, special environment event, uh, as well as only focus on this, uh, a narrow bandwidth, uh, similar to the idea of regression discontinuity design. All right, so here are the results. Let's fo first focus on the impact of these events on commercial consumers' uh, hourly electricity consumption. Here, x-axis shows the number of days uh, on or post the event, okay? Now here, uh, the first panel of figure shows the impact of Earth hour. Now these uh, black dots shows the uh, change in electricity consumption, and these vertical lines shows the 95% of confidence interval. So here you can see that for the Earth hour, there is no statistically significant impact on the electricity consumption behavior of consumer users, uh, of com commercial consumer users. And then now for the award environment today, you can see that on the day of the World Environmental Day, the coefficient is negative and this is significant, implying that on the World Environmental Day, the commercial users are reducing their electricity consumption uh, by about uh, 17%. Right? Now, the next uh, panel shows the energy savings week impact. Now, because energy saving week uh, is one week, so we're showing the results for each of the day uh, during the week, as well as the days after the week. Here you can see that during the, uh, the days of, of the, within the energy saving week, all the coefficients are negative, uh, almost all coefficients are negative and statistically significant, implying that commercial users are saving their electricity uh, during the national energy savings week. However, immediately after the national energy saving week uh, ended, such energy cons uh, conservation effect decayed rapidly, almost immediately disappeared. And this is similar uh, almost similar to the environment today, where the conservation effect decayed rapidly immediately after the special environmental events ended. All right, and then on average for the energy saving week, you save about 8% of reduction uh, every day during the uh, energy saving week. All right, so that's the results for commercial users. And then for the residential users, um, the, the, the results are actually none of these events work. Okay. So for World Environment Today and Energy Saving Week, uh, they do not impose any significant uh, impact on the day of the event or during the week of the event. And then uh, actually for the Earth Hour, as well as for the Energy Saving Week, after the event ended, there are actually rebound effect, meaning that the residential users increased their consumption after these environmental events ended. All right, so the next question is why we observe such heterogeneous uh, responses to these different events uh, among residential and commercial com uh, consumers as well as to the different events. Now to answer this question, we conducted a mechanism analysis uh, where we reviewed all the rel related policy documents in 2017, as well as web scraped all the trace data, relevant trace data from uh, uh, Sina Weibo, which is basically Ch the Chinese version of Twitter. And then here are the results that can uh, help us to explain our findings. Uh, here, uh, this table shows the main activities, the type of activities conducted for the Earth Hour as well as for the Environmental Day and National Energy Saving Week. The key difference between these two type of uh, ev uh, events are that the most activities during the World Environmental Day and the National Energy Publicity Week are directly related to the knowledge and skills of environment protection and energy saving. For example, uh, um, activities such as environmental knowledge competition, technology knowledge competition, okay? Versus for the Earth Hour, most of the activities are symbolic and have nothing to do with energy consumption itself, such as night running, cycling, uh, compensation contacts, okay? All right, so based on our finding and the mechanism analysis, we propose the following policy uh, implications. First, that we should pay special attention to the event of Earth Hour. As we show that the Earth Hour uh, had no impact on commercial users' consumption, as well as, as having uh, causing rebound effect of residential users' consumption. Okay. So although the symbolic activities, such as turning off the lights for one hour or cycling and those activities during the Earth Hour can arouse people's much greater attention, uh, and towards environment, but it had limited power to lead to actual energy saving behaviors. 
and the Earth Hour should adopt more activities that are directly related to the knowledge and skills of environmental protection and energy saving. And the next implication is that we should pay more attention to residential users. Our results show that residential users do not save energy, but commercial users do. Okay. And then, so the insignificant response could be partially due to the fact that in China, the government can actually exert more direct impact on the commercial users, such as through uh, uh, for some state-owned enterprises or direct impact on uh, these corporations compared to the residential users. So there should be uh, approaches in the future that can better and directly targeted at residential users to influence their electricity consumption behavior. All right, so uh, that's the end of my presentation and thank you for your attention and look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks uh, for this very impressive speech. Uh, as far as we know, uh, poverty alleviation or energy poverty alleviation is one of the uh, 17th UN Sustainable Development Goals. So this poverty actually is a, a key determinant to labor productivity, economic growth, and social well-being. So this is very important for, for the country or for the region to solve these kind of issues. And in, uh, in her speech, Lucy has shown to us the effectiveness of this uh, government effort, and she also has shared with us how the campaigns, uh, energy saving campaigns and uh, uh, various campaigns have changed the consumer's behavior, in particular can change the consumer behaviors of, the, of those uh, commercial users. Yeah. Uh, we are also very surprised to see that the residential consumers are not affected by, by this kind of uh, campaign. So uh, this uh, actually pro provide a very clear uh, policy implication for future uh, design of, of different campaign uh, activities in order to, to change the uh, behaviors of the consumers. Okay, thanks again, Lucy. So uh, although we have two questions, I guess we leave all the questions to the end of this uh, webinar for, for discussions. Okay, so uh, please allow me to uh, introduce our second speaker, Dr. Gang He. Uh, Gang is an assistant professor in the Department of Technology and Society at St Stony Brook University, as well as a visiting faculty affiliate with the International Energy Analysis Department at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. His research focuses on energy system modeling, energy environment, and sustainability. He also has published in top journals, including Major Communication, One Earth, she will also share a research from the supply side with a focus on how renewable, renewable technology and storage technology and decreasing costs affect the energy market. Okay, Gang, the time's yours. Thank you, Ning and the IAEE for this opportunity to share our uh, research. Um, my presentation will yeah, mostly sure. based on the paper we uh, published at the Leisure Communication on the impact of a rapidly cost decrease of renewable energy and storage and how that could accelerate the decarbonization of China's power system. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Ning Jiang and uh, Amo Pandai uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory among with other co-authors. The background of this research is over the last uh, decades, renewable energy costs has uh, declined rapidly. This chart from uh, International Renewable Energy Agency shares uh, solar panel, the cost of solar panel uh, has decreased by 82% uh, over the past decade. And this very similar story for CSP, uh, onshore wind and offshore wind. Uh, for onshore wind is about 40% of a decrease, offshore wind 30, about 30% 30 of a decrease. However, those cost trends uh, has not were captured in the modeling community, including the uh, top uh, modeling groups, uh, such as uh, IEA in its flagship report, World Energy Outlook, uh, their projection keep uh, underestimate, uh, for example, the installation of a PV. Uh, the uh, black line is the real installation and those lines are their projection 
in different years of uh, world energy outlook. Uh, it's not better uh, in EI, which is uh, Energy Information Administration uh, in the US, uh, and very similar story, they uh, underestimate uh, uh, the installation of the uh, wind and uh, uh, solar projection. So we, uh, and, uh, we are trying to uh, ask the questions, um, what if this cost constraints continue? Uh, how would China's power system uh, uh, change? Uh, and what are the costs to achieve those change? What the impact to the regional pattern of a power system and in the infrastructure needed to facilitate such change? Essential question is how good we can achieve and what's the re uh, impact of the declining cost to the power system. So in order to answer those questions, we rely uh, updated the uh, switch China model uh, in order to capture the impact of renewables. Uh, switch is an acronym of a solar, wind, uh, hydro, and a conventional te technology investment model. It's a capacity expansion model uh, using high resolution data, both spatial and temporary uh, data. For the switch China model, we use hourly uh, data uh, and run at the provincial level. So it optimizes the overall cost of the power system, including the generation, transmission, and the distribution. And uh, so we can capture the impact of uh, uh, renewable energy at the same time. We can uh, incorporate the uh, technology and other uh, policy uh, constraints or policy technology policy goals. And the output of uh, the model uh, will uh, reflect as uh, the generation mix, the capacity mix, and the transmission uh, expansions. Uh, other indicators such as uh, the impact to carbon emissions and impact to power cost can also be uh, calculated uh, from the model. Uh, so I mentioned that the objective function is to minimize the co overall cost of the power system, including the generation, operation, and transmission uh, costs within the constraints of uh, always meet, supply meet uh, the demand and meet the requirement of reserve margin, operating reserves and other technology goals such as uh, non-fossil uh, goals or technology specific goals such as wind and solar installation goals. Um, so to use this model we need uh, uh, high resolution data and the wind solo uh, data are based on uh, um, my previous work on um, uh, high resolution assessment of wind and solar uh, energy in China. Uh, basically to answer the question of when, where, and how much wind and solar are available. Using this uh, assessment, uh, we can uh, develop the model for the re this research purpose. So essentially it's the impact uh, of uh, the variable wind and solar resources. Uh, and for this study, we start, uh, studied uh, four scenarios, including the business as euro scenario, uh, the low cost renewable scenario, which incorporated the recent uh, cost decline of uh, renewables and storage. And in order to study how this can facilitate the carbon uh, mitigation goals, we studied the two scenarios, uh, two carbon scenarios. One is C50, it's an idea to what if um, we have a carbon goal that have 50% of reduction uh, in the power sector uh, carbon emission from 2015 level by 2030. And the C80 is more exponential uh, to explore the potential uh, of 80% uh, of uh, a reduction, which might not uh, 
sound um, uh, feasible, but we just want to uh, capture what are the uh, potential impact there. So there are, we assume uh, existing policy that no new coal power, uh, power plants after two, uh, 2020 because there are uh, tight regulations on air pollution and uh, carbon mitigation measures. So uh, new coal power plants after 2020 are not allowed in all those scenarios. And in both C50 and C80 scenarios, their uh, renewable costs are the same assumptions as in the low cost uh, renewables. Uh, for sure, the renewable uh, costs uh, are key uh, assumptions for this study. So we use uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, projections in the annual technology baseline. And uh, as you can see here, the sorting line are the cost assumptions we use in the uh, BAU scenario. And the dotted line are the cost projections uh, by uh, NREL. And you can see uh, in there, the cost of projection, uh, you can see a, a big uh, decline there uh, to 2030. And for wind and solar, at the, uh, about the uh, cost at $600 uh, per kilowatt. And for storage, at about $400. Uh, dollar per kilowatt by 2030. That's a, a significant uh, uh, lower cost than in the BAU scenario. So what our, uh, our key findings here, first is the uh, capacity mix. I'll highlight the results in the uh, renewable, lower cost of renewable uh, energy scenario. As you can see here with low cost of renewable, there's a uh, extensive expansion of uh, solar and wind uh, capacities, um, which replacing coal uh, in the uh, renewable scenario. And uh, in the generation mix, because capacity does not necessarily translate to the energy and the energy is really important. And you can see uh, from if you add solar, wind, uh, and nuclear and hydro together by 2030, uh, this can all, con all together can contribute about 62% uh, 60, of the uh, power generation uh, as compared to the current policy discussion uh, about 50% of a uh, non-fossil goal by 2030. Uh, so that's a uh, a big jump, 10% uh, more uh, uh, as compared to the current discussion. And in order to uh, achieve that, for sure, you can see uh, there is a big demand of uh, uh, inter province or inter-regional uh, transmission infrastructure needed. And this is where the new, uh, the energy flow uh, between different uh, um, uh, regional grid that you can see there are new uh, resources and, uh, and the generation centers uh, as renewables becomes uh, available, especially in the uh, lost west um, grid. And the, gener uh, the transmission capacity expansion, uh, new transmission needed is as big as 30 gigawatt uh, scale. Uh, in, in the inter-provincial uh, transmission. Uh, and you may be curious about the impact to cost from our uh, calculation. And as you can see here, in, there are uh, two important uh, messages here. First, uh, in the renewable uh, scenario, you can see um, that uh, the cost is, uh, is about 16% of a lower cost than in the uh, BAU uh, scenario. And uh, one other very interesting finding is even to achieve 50% of uh, uh, carbon mitigation and the cost is, is cheaper in, with lower cost of renewables. And that's quite a, 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 
a positive finding and it shows some um, optimism that we what uh, we can do well, with all this uh, uh, changing uh, economics of the renewables and uh, storage. So uh, I'll sum up uh, some of the key uh, conclusions, conclusions and uh, for discussions. Uh, first is uh, renewable really uh, changed very fast over the past uh, decade. And the global weighted average cost of uh, uh, electricity of a utility scale, solar PV, onshore wind, and a battery storage in, um, uh, in China and globally uh, uh, has plumped by 82%, um, 39%, uh, and for storage is 88% roughly, respectively. And according to uh, Irina and uh, Bloomberg New Energy Foundation, uh, uh, New Energy Finance, from their uh, industry uh, study and uh, observations. And our work is uh, essentially ask if those cost trends continue. And our results show that 62% of China's electricity could come from non-fossil sources by 2030 at a cost that is uh, about 10% lower than uh, achieved through the BAU approach. And uh, if we think about a carbon uh, goal that uh, with the lower cost of renewable, China's power sector could cut half of its 2015 carbon emission at a cost about 6% uh, lower. Uh, for more deeper um, reduction, let's say 80% of a reduction, then that would require higher power cost about 37% uh, higher. And that translated to about uh, a carbon price at about uh, $20 per ton of CO2. So our main contributions is uh, first, we review the implications of a cost decrease on uh, power systems, and this offers new per perspective on the clean uh, power transition as compared to uh, the projections by uh, mainstream uh, uh, modeling groups. Uh, we, this also demonstrates uh, the impact of a fast cost decrease of renewables and storage sources. Uh, this scenario is not just uh, happening in China, it could also work uh, in United States and other countries. As you may follow uh, the, some recent reports by uh, University of California, Berkeley, and uh, the Energy Innovation um, uh, LLC, and they talk about uh, two, uh, the, the uh, power systems by 2035 in the United States to have uh, uh, at least 80% of uh, renewables uh, in power system. And those are, are showing um, globally the positive impact of the cost trend. And uh, this also shows uh, the fast decarbonization in the power sector is both technically feasible and economically uh, beneficial. And this offers the prospect that um, large emission mitigation with uh, global impact, because conventionally we may discuss this as a long-term goal as far as 2050. And now we may be able to do some, to, you know, to move forward the timeline to, to 2030 or 2035. And uh, this will uh, heavily contribute to what uh, uh, President Xi mentioned, uh, the carbon neutrality by 2060. And uh, you, the essential question, uh, how can we achieve it? And this uh, uh, cost trends definitely shows some optimism that um, uh, this is my, uh, doable. So for sure, for any model, uh, model new work, there are uncertainties. Uh, uh, it's very importantly, can the price decrease sustain? Uh, uh, how low it can achieve? 
and there might also uh, fluctuation um, by you know, the material costs and other uh, factors. And also uh, because when we talk about 2030, 2035, uh, the scale of uh, the infrastructure needed, let's say uh, the scale of capacity uh, building and the, uh, the scale of uh, the transmission expansion are huge. And can we um, support such scale of uh, infrastructure expansion? And uh, there are also uh, technology inertia as the coal uh, uh, fleet. And because 80% uh, of uh, China's coal capacity uh, are built after 2000 uh, uh, and uh, they are quite new. So uh, how we can we achieve only uh, retirement of those uh, uh, assets, uh, and there are questions there. And also, uh, this to in order to achieve this, we rely on the power sector reform in order to make the regional power markets work. As you see from the results, that well, we need uh, uh, transmission to move electricity around, and that rely on the power sector reform and the constructions of the electricity markets. Uh, there are other uh, challenges such as storage uh, at such large scale. Can we sustain the material uh, needed to, um, to, uh, to create such uh, big ex uh, uh, storage capacity? And there are also life cycle uh, cost and life cycle impact of the storage. Um, in the end, uh, they, uh, many people will be impacted by this uh, clean power transition and uh, how we maintain and um, the social uh, economic impacts and to have a just transition. Uh, they are all uh, uncertainties and the challenges, challenges of it. So uh, one of the paper, related paper is the, uh, because renewables uh, show some uh, good news at the same time, uh, that's not enough. We have to deal with coal and, and the coal transition has to happen rapidly and um, uh, just. Uh, I probably do not have time to go to details of them. If you are interested, there are some related uh, uh, publications of uh, uh, the model and uh, this work. Um, thank you. That's uh, my uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, thank you for your speech, Gang. Uh, Gang actually uh, brings uh, brings brings us a very exciting news from the technology development in China, uh, or at a global level. So I think with the, this uh, continuous development of these renewable technologies, I believe that the potential cost of energy transition would be further lowered, uh, or even turned into a green growth model. So that means that we are able to do a deep decarbonization at the early stage, and we are able to uh, achieve a zero uh, emission uh, by an, at an early, uh, early years. So thank you. Now, uh, I'll be very pleased to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Da Zhang. Uh, da is an associate professor at the Institute of Energy, Environment and Economy at Tsinghua University. His research are the economic and environmental analysis of China's energy and climate policy, integrated assessment, and power system modeling. Prior to joining Tsinghua, he worked at MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Climate Change. He has also published in Nature Energy and Nature Climate Change. In today's webinar, he will share with us on the development of China's national emission trading scheme and its implications on green growth. Let's listen to that. Um, thank you very much, Ling, and uh, thank you, uh, IEE, for this great opportunity to uh, share some of my thoughts uh, with colleagues. And uh, as you have uh, seen, uh, uh, Professor Chiu and Professor He have great, uh, give very great presentations about their research. Um, and uh, I think for me, I was thinking to also give a presentation of uh, my recent research, but I 
I think uh, having this great opportunity, I would like to also uh, share some uh, of the some recent developments of China's natural ETS because we, uh, the Energy uh, Institute of Energy, Environment, and Economy at Tsinghua University, uh, is in relatively uh, very luckily good position uh, to work uh, with the Chinese government uh, uh, for the uh, ETS design and some uh, uh, other recent uh, climate policy uh, developments, uh, including the uh, new uh, long-term uh, decarbonization target just uh, released uh, yesterday. So uh, we have been holding the secret for a while, but it was very uh, excited to, to see it's uh, officially re released. And I think I'm here uh, very happy to, to share this um, uh, great news with a lot of friends who is also uh, staying uh, online. I, 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 I see your names, but uh, I, I couldn't see you, but I believe uh, you are doing also very well and we will see uh, each other very soon. So um, yeah, back to the presentation. So um, this is uh, just very uh, brief overview of uh, the uh, recent progress of China's national ETS. So I would just briefly uh, introduce the, the coverage, the threshold, uh, uh, and uh, allowance allocation methods, um, things that I can share um, here. Uh, and for, for other, I think, some design uh, details, I'm also happy to uh, answer questions, uh, if I can, uh, in the later Q&A session. Um, the, the coverage of uh, the uh, China's um, natural ETS, I think in, in its full-fledged form, hopefully by the end of uh, the 14th uh, five-year plan, uh, which is 2025, uh, is to cover about, mm, I think, eight uh, sectors, um, uh, which are uh, mostly energy intensive uh, industrial sectors in China. Uh, so we uh, uh, expect the ETS will start from the uh, power sector and uh, it later will be expanded to cover other uh, major energy intensive sectors, uh, uh, for example, iron steel, non ferrous metal, uh, construction material, and so on. Um, the emissions um, that to be accounted uh, to be priced in the um, uh, emission trading market uh, are both direct emissions from uh, burning fossil fuels uh, by the firms uh, participating in the ETS and also indirect emissions associated with the use of uh, electricity and heat. Um, probably you will, you, you, the um, astute audience will notice that there's a double counting, but actually this is kind of a, um, compromise in the initial uh, policy design uh, because as you know uh, the electricity sector uh, is heavily uh, regulated still heavily regulated uh, in China uh, we we are also expecting a very big role of the market reform and deregulation uh, but uh, currently uh, I think uh, more than half of the uh, electricity consumed in China uh, still uh, face some price regulation, which means the additional, uh, the, the price signal from uh, the additional carbon cost uh, will not be uh, passed through the, to, to, uh, through, through the system to, to the energy users. Um, therefore, um, for the uh, end users uh, which use electricity, if they really they, they use a lot of electricity and uh, including the ETS, they will also uh, have to pay the uh, carbon price for the indirect emissions from the electricity that they use. So that's the uh, basic rationale why the direct, both direct and indirect emissions are included or accounted uh, in China's ETS. Uh, for the threshold, uh, the um, I think uh, um, the the current plan is to to cover um, um, firms that have emissions higher than twenty six thousand tons of CO two per year. Um, this number is uh, is chosen because 
that is equivalent to uh, 10,000 uh, tons of coal equivalent consumption uh, a year for, um, for, 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 for the industrial users because these firms have already been included in um, multiple policy initiatives uh, that have been uh, that have launched uh, in China, including uh, you know like the uh, energy uh, saving and uh, or energy conservation program uh, discussed by um, well uh, studied by by Professor Chu and other uh, researchers before. So the, these firms have been um, already in the scope of uh, government regulation. So they have already experienced some energy audits and um, uh, multiple forms of uh, the energy conservation uh, campaign. Uh, so uh, there should be uh, not a big shock uh, for them if they enter the uh, national ETS. Um, um, so so to, 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 to give you flavor, so this 26,000 tons of CO2 emissions per year uh, means roughly uh, 30 million kilowatt hour for energy user uh, per year if uh, this firm only uh, consume electricity as their uh, uh, energy source. Uh, you may think uh, that's a very high number, but actually in China it's uh, not really high for, for industrial users. Uh, I have been to like many, many uh, factories uh, that have this kind of scale of uh, energy use. Um, so then, uh, as you see, uh, we expect about um, uh, 7,500 firms to be regulated uh, by the end of 14th uh, 5F10 um, uh, for, uh, in the uh, China's uh, national ETS. And uh, about half of China's total energy-related emissions uh, will be uh, included and priced uh, under this scheme. And this scheme will definitely become the largest uh, emission trading scheme uh, in the world. Um, and I think another important issue uh, I would like to briefly discuss is the uh, allowance allocation methods. So this is uh, the fundamental difference uh, of China's uh, national ETS compared to uh, other uh, existing uh, emission trading schemes. Um, in China's ETS, the allowance is allocated, uh, um, I think, for, at least for, for its uh, initial operation, free and uh, output based. Uh, it's similar to the uh, benchmarking uh, allowance allocation uh, uh, scheme uh, used elsewhere, but uh, the the quantity that is used for benchmarking uh, is adjusted uh, every year by the activity level of each firm. And uh, I think uh, some of you may have already seen uh, a draft for this allocation uh, allowance allocation methods for power sector. Uh, which supposed to be internally circulated early this month, um, but for some reason there's a leaked version uh, online. And if you are interested, you can definitely find it. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, posted by a, a official recount uh, of a consulting company uh, on WeChat, and it was deleted, and then it re reappeared. Uh, well, we don't know the reason how it's come leaked, but. Uh, you will see a lot of details um, um, uh, from this draft. Uh, so you, you can blame us if you find some uh, very, uh, something that you don't like because we have been participating uh, in this uh, policy making progress. And actually we are very, uh, we, we are keen to know uh, what you think about design and uh, uh, and specifically uh, uh, some issues that uh, you may uh, notice uh, or you, 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 you can expect that could emerge later. Um, well, uh, we sometimes, you know, this face a lot of constraints and also for policymakers, they, they also have to compromise a lot uh, when they uh, 
run this kind of uh, when you run a program with this kind of uh, scale, uh, especially uh, it, it is launched for the first time. And, and uh, well, um, although the uh, um, allowance will be uh, allocated for free, uh, I think during uh, the first few years of the ETS, uh, we still have the hope there could be some form of auction uh, in later years, and uh, it would be tested um, at some point. Uh, currently, I have been also doing a very uh, a study at very early age uh, with some colleagues uh, to to design um, some non classical uh, uh, auction scheme uh, which could be used uh, in the future allowance allocation. Uh, for example, like the consignment auction, which has been already uh, used in uh, California ETS. Uh, and uh, we we hope uh, some policy innovation could also uh, help China's CTS to to address some uh, complications. And uh, this is a uh, just figure to uh, to give you a sense how this uh, uh, free uh, allowance based on uh, the benchmark uh, and activity level is worked. Uh, so, for example, we have two firms, uh, two power plants. Uh, on the left, there's a low efficient coal fired power plants, and on the right, there's a high efficient coal fired plants. And this is the simple word we have only two power plants, and we have a single benchmark for these two power plants. And for the low efficient coal uh, fired power plants on the left, uh, it has a high, it, it has a, a, um, a CO2 intensity per kilowatt hour of generation higher in the benchmark and uh, for the uh, high efficient power plant uh, is CO2 intensity is lower than benchmark then which means uh, if the low efficient power plant generates one kilowatt hour of electricity uh, it will gain uh, uh, some uh, emission allowances for free but the number is lower than uh, the amount of allowances it needs to submit to the government because its CO2 intensity is higher than the benchmark. Uh, therefore, the low efficient uh, power plants need to buy allowances in the market uh, because it has a shortage of uh, allowances and it will pay money. And the high efficient co uh, the power plants will, will gain money. And if we look at the, um, uh, the emission cap of uh, well, this is called a tradable performance standard scheme. Uh, it will be different from the uh, cap and trade implemented elsewhere, because for a cap and trade system, uh, the cap uh, of the total emissions is a fixed number, is predetermined. Uh, but for developing countries uh, like China, which uh, has very uh, dynamic economic growth rate, and well, I think in this year, like every economy has very dynamic uh, uh, economic performance. So we have a lot of uncertainties and we may have a lot of shocks in the future. Uh, so it's very important to, to make the system flexible, uh, but also at the same time has some flexibility. So the uh, emission capital for TPS uh, is uh, adjusted uh, according to the um, uh, activity level uh, of different sectors. So this is the equation how, uh, if you would like to, to calculate the emission cap of a TPS system. And uh, another, uh, another example is, uh, well, what is how, how we will select the benchmark uh, for a specific, specific sector, uh, like a power sector. Um, so, um, here is a figure that shows the emission intensity of different uh, power plants in China. As you can see, even for this kind of homogeneous good, there's a huge productivity difference uh, or spread uh, within this sector. So if you rank the emission intensity from the lowest uh, power plant to the highest power plant, you will see a very huge spread. And if we select a sector's average, 
um, uh, as the benchmark, uh, we will see, uh, well, if they also produce uh, the same uh, electricity, uh, amount of electricity each year, there will be a balance of supply and demand, which means um, the, the total emissions uh, of this sector will be equivalent uh, than the uh, uh, equivalent to the total allowances allocated freely in this sector. Uh, this means the price of the allowance will be zero because uh, the the total demand is equal to total supply, uh, even nobody reduce emissions. Um, so we will select uh, the uh, benchmark using uh, some uh, uh, well performance uh, uh, power plants, a group of power plants to to derive the um, uh, the, the value of the benchmark. Uh, we can of course select the best 10% average as a benchmark, but it will be very stringent, uh, which means uh, most of the uh, power plants uh, needs to to buy allowances if they do not do anything. Um, if we select the best 30% average as a benchmark, it will be also uh, kind of stringent. So um, for some in the initial years of uh, the emission trading, so we we, we choose um, uh, not that stringent uh, benchmark uh, in the beginning uh, to not introduce uh, too, too much uh, transition cost but the benchmark will be lower over time to increase the stringency uh, of uh, the, the scheme. So we have been also doing some uh, scenario analysis uh, with uh, some colleagues to, to evaluate the potential string, uh, policy stringency and also the uh, efficiency or welfare uh, implications of different uh, uh, benchmark design. Because here is the simplest case, but uh, actually, there could be multiple benchmarks uh, for for specific specific sector uh, in reality. So uh, uh, there there would be some trade off um, uh, between between efficiency and equity when 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 we uh, select uh, different uh, benchmarks for for the trading. Uh, so this is the last slide. So um, we expect China's ETS will, uh, as I said, cover eight sectors and price uh, half of China's energy related carbon emissions by 2025. Uh, so at uh, this point, 2020, we now uh, have already seven or uh, using different standards or eight uh, regional uh, ETS pilots in China. And we have been in a start and trial phase of the national ETS for two years and uh, uh, we really hope there will be a formal launch of the national ETS by the end of this year. And we have uh, our fingers crossed for that. And uh, we then will have a phase two, uh, which is the development and improvement phase for the national ETS uh, for the next five year plan. And hopefully, um, well, now we have more hope uh, this uh, system will will be transformed maybe to a mass-based uh, system um, after 2025 uh, because China will uh, have a hopefully more stable uh, economic growth rate. And uh, as uh, Professor, uh, President Xi has already committed, we, we will peak uh, the emissions before 2030. So uh, maybe at, uh, by that time, it will be mature to introduce a mass-based uh, national ETS. Um, so that's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Da, for sharing with us on uh, this uh, China's ETS. Uh, actually, I, I think China's ETS could be uh, potentially become uh, the largest carbon market in the world and could significantly uh, drive down the emissions in, in, in China. And I think also this is a big step action for, for China to achieve its ambitious climate target committed in the uh, Paris Agreement. Okay, thank you again for all the three speakers. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our distinguished speakers have finished their talk. So now we uh, enter into this uh, Q&A session. Uh, if you have any question, you can uh, type in this uh, Q&A Q &A panel. So I already uh, 
got some questions for our speakers. Uh, the first question I think is for Lucy. So uh, what are the mechanisms why which solar PV increases disposable income? For example, do people start businesses because of newly gained access to electricity? Uh, Lucy, would you like to answer this? Yes, uh, thanks for the question. It's an excellent question. We actually got the same exact question when we were uh, doing the IR and nature communications. Um, so as I mentioned in the diagram, uh, the one direct impact is the direct the revenue allocation between the PV project owner and the uh, villagers. That's the income from selling the electricity to the grid, grid company. That's one channel. And the second channel uh, is more similar to what you were asking is the indirect impact through local uh, economy uh, uh, stimulus. For example, uh, it's less of a story about electricity access because in those rural villages, even though they might be poor, but then they still have access to electricity. But it's more a story about uh, solar PV projects can have, for example, an impact on local supply chain. There might be for them service, increased services for the construction uh, and then and other uh, secondary uh, industries that might be related to constructing solar PV and maintenance of solar PV. All right, yeah. hopefully that answers your question. And also the second question is also for you. Uh, how do you define the commercial users, offices or factories or how can they how they can accommodate these power use? Uh, yes, so um, these are basically non-residential users that indeed include offices, uh, factories, uh, include factories that operate 24-7. Um, so in terms of how they can achieve uh, energy reduction, it could be through, for example, uh, when people are not using the offices, they can turn off lights and, and also uh, even when they're using the office, there could be more efficient control of the thermostats. In terms of factories, um, that's, that, that's a good question because they, are, they need the uh, usage to operate their machines, but then there can still be room for energy efficiency improvements, for example, uh, by still more efficiently uh, turn off some of the equipment that they're not using for a certain period of time. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I think uh, we also have got some a couple of questions for, for Gang. So the third question is from uh, Yana. Uh, she would like to know uh, what it means for 2016 China's achieving carbon neutrality regarding changes needed in the power generation sector. Still, within your studies, most aggressive scenario or something more than that is needed. Thank you, Yana. I hope to see you. <laughs> um, that's a very uh, hard question. I think it uh, Go is just uh, released, so I haven't done any research on that for uh, this long term, uh, especially up to, to uh, 2060. So I do not have a good answer for it. Uh, a couple of uh, observations, though, I, I may share from my own work. First is uh, the 2060 is um, economic wide uh, carbon neutrality uh, goal usually power sector has to be uh, achieved that goal uh, ahead of the economic wide goal. So which means that uh, the power sector has to achieve uh, carbon neutrality or net zero emission uh, by 2040, if not 2050. Uh, uh, that's with, uh, from our work, uh, which, which have, uh, uh, we look at more uh, short term uh, by 2030, uh, we, we show that 50% uh, of uh, uh, decarbonization is economically feasible. Uh, I mean, it's doable and economic feasible. And beyond that, we know uh, the increment, any incremental reduction would be uh, more challenging at a higher cost. Uh, so that means uh, innovation, technology innovation, the market uh, reform, and, and the infrastructure needed, those different pieces all needed in order to achieve uh, those goals. Um, so I, I do not have a, have a good answer, but uh, I can only share uh, what uh, we uh, have done in the research. Yeah, actually, the, the term uh, carbon neutrality appeared officially in the uh, policy agenda in, in China is yesterday, right? Yesterday, uh, our presidency announced about this uh, ambitious target. 
So I think a lot of work can be done related to this carbon neutrality. Both our distinguished speakers and also our uh, audience could do a lot of work to, to answer this question together. Uh, so the next question is also for Gang. How likely it is for cost declines to continue at the same rate? The history of technological development suggests that symbiotic uh, flattering. Uh, yes, uh, that's very important. Thank you, uh, Gakken. Um, when we say uh, this, if this cost uh, trend continue, not necessarily continue at the same rate. Uh, it's continued the uh, declining trend. And we use uh, the best available projection from ANREA. Mm -hmm. So we did not do our own projection. And uh, their projection most rely on the technology uh, advancement uh, and uh, the penetration. And uh, there is a, a learning rate uh, or learning curve as commonly uh, used in the um, uh, technology development uh, domain. Uh, basically, uh, the, the idea is uh, what the cost uh, uh, reduction if double the global capacity. And in the PV case, um, up to uh, 2010 to now, it's at about 40%, of, uh, uh, which means double PV capacity reduced the cost by uh, 40%. And that's quite uh, uh, impressive. Uh, can these trends continue? Um, I don't know, uh, but uh, uh, I can only share that the PV is still in the uh, exponential growth curve in the penetration curve, which means that the cost uh, can still uh, decline over uh, the, the uh, coming uh, decades. Um, uh, once you reach saturation of the penetration curve, that makes it harder to uh, uh, the cost to decrease. So uh, I can see it's con uh, the cost decrease will continue, but uh, how long it will continue, we will see how fast this will uh, expand. Okay, another technical question from uh, Gukan is, uh, did you include the cost of TD infrastructure balancing and backup generation or storage to ensure 24 by 7 delivery of electricity in your total cost calculations? Uh, yes, uh, we include uh, transmission and distribution costs uh, for transmission, uh, it's uh, a, uh, it's a uh, relationship with the uh, total capacity and the distance of the transmission. Uh, distrib uh, distribution is more complicated. We uh, make assumptions of uh, its uh, uh, cost uh, as a share of the overall energy uh, distributed. Uh, balancing and the backup generation and the storage, yes. Um, uh, we we have the uh, backup uh, capacity to meet the reserve uh, currently set at about 15 percent uh, of uh, a reserve capacity, uh, and that's included for storage to ensure uh, twenty four seven delivery of electricity. That's more complicated because we make assumptions of a storage for four hours. Uh, to make the uh, model feasible, uh, we should uh, we, we should uh, improve it. Uh, maybe in the future, uh, 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 study uh, how to better incorporate the storage and uh, the operation of the storage. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gang. Uh, next question is for Da. Uh, how would you like? To, would you estimate the uh, power plant emissions for each plant? because uh, you show one slide, uh, a figure of the example of the sector's initial intensity and average lives. Well, this data is actually uh, administrative data that we have some limited access to. Uh, basically, this data is collected by the um, provincial government uh, who uh, spends, I think, very large of uh, funding to support the uh, MRV. Um, of the uh, CO2 emissions of all those power plants included uh, to be included in ETS. So that's uh, based on uh, the um, uh, uh, very standard MRV. So, uh, and also another question for you regarding the China's ETS design. 
So is the free allowance allocation uniform across sector? Uh, well, the, uh, the the rationale to derive the uh, benchmark uh, is to achieve, uh, well, we hope uh, a certain amount of uh, emission intensity reduction, um, for example, within every year. So for for uh, electricity, uh, for example, that's one percent emission intensity reduction, and hopefully maybe for for cement that would be also 1% emission intensity reduction. Uh, having said that, we are fully aware uh, that you may have different uh, basement costs in these uh, different sectors. So uh, it could happen that uh, uh, the, the, the cement sector reduce a lot of uh, emissions and uh, it sell a lot of allowances to a power sector. And then I think it will be uh, dynamically adjusted, uh, I mean, for mm -hmm. the benchmark. Yeah, yeah. So will there be a regulated price floor for this uh, tradable permits? Well, I think it's under discussion and uh, we, we don't know what exact uh, level of this price floor, if there is a price floor, but I think in your mind, it, the, the price should be uh, around 100 yuan per, per, uh, per ton if it can generate a meaningful price signal right, to reduce right. emissions. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. So another question is also for Gang. Again, uh, how feasible it is for China to be carbon neutral by 2060? <laughs> oh, I think we, we should uh, we, we right, can right. All discuss this question. Right, uh, right. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, but I, I can only show uh, share some uh, maybe optimism from my observation on that. I don't know how, how feasible. We need more study on that. Exactly. Uh, first, uh, I think uh, is trying to really see the opportunity from achieving carbon neutrality uh, in the longer term, and that's uh, based on because China see the opportunity in the clean energy revolution, and it's a new uh, command, commanding height for uh, economic competition. And that's the first time China feel can compete at the same starting line with other countries uh, with the West. And China can even have an uh, advantage as a early mover in that domain. And so which means that that's very consistent with the new uh, uh, economic opportunities there. And that's a, that's a good news. And China is already a uh, uh, actually a, a, a leader in that uh, sphere. I, I recently from the, uh, econo the economist, they have, uh, uh, I think those numbers are quite uh, impressive. I, I can share some numbers there. Now Chinese firm produce 72% uh, of uh, the world solar modules, uh, 69 of its near battery, 45 of its wind turbine, and also control much of the refining materials critical for uh, re, uh, clean energy. So uh, that means uh, th this is consistent with China's uh, economic interest and uh, that's good news. And second, as I mentioned in uh, this work, renewable costs and storage costs are getting crazy, uh, crazy cheaper and uh, that's also good news. And if it's cheaper and it's economic, uh, uh, feasible, uh, economic uh, variable, then we need to do more and at a faster uh, speed. And third is this transition uh, really uh, has a lot of uh, co-benefits or benefits uh, as we did a, a rough estimation in the uh, One Earth paper of a co-transition uh, we showed that uh, the fast or the most aggressive coal transition can um, have uh, save uh, as much as 224,000 premature deaths and also save about 4.4, uh, sorry, 4.3 billion uh, cubic meters of uh, water uh, in when, uh, 2050 uh, annually, those savings are annually. So those are the benefits of uh, the uh, transition. And that's also have benefits in air pollution, uh, mitigation, and 
So luckily those factors are aligned with the carbon neutrality. So I see optimism of a, uh, China to achieve the, uh, the, the longer term goal. Yeah, I agree with uh, with Gang that uh, in in general we should be able to achieve this uh, so-called carbon neutrality from the technical aspects and also from the the policy aspects. As we uh, uh, both the, our speakers, uh, Professor Chu and Professor He, already shared with us, right? So both from the uh, policy aspects and from the uh, demand side and from the technical supply side, we also have achieved quite a lot of significant uh, progress on on doing this. And again, we have a couple of questions for, for Da again to, to talk about the ETS. So how many benchmarks to be used in the power sectors ETS? Uh, da, you have to unmute. Oh, sure, sorry. And uh, good to see question from Yana and hope you are doing well. And uh, we will have some initial discussion to have three or four benchmarks. But I think uh, in that leaked version, uh, maybe you have already seen, uh, there are four benchmarks. And I think that would be uh, uh, that the, the case that we would use in the uh, formal release of the, uh, that I, I think, um, uh, release of the ETS. Uh, in the future, that could be change of uh, or, or merge of the benchmarks because we have been also discussing with uh, some colleagues uh, in the US, US like uh, Larry Goder and uh, Billy Pizer, and I think um, some of uh, these US experts, they, they, they are big proponents for a single benchmark because, well, in theory, that, that's more efficient. Uh, but there are also other concerns. Um, for other sectors of the um, uh, a sector version of the ETS, uh, I think that depends uh, we are now working for the uh, benchmark design for the cement, uh, aluminum, and iron steel sector. Uh, we don't have uh, a lot of knowledge for the benchmark setting for other sectors because, for example, for, for, for petrochemical, the, there are too many products and it's very challenging to, to set up the benchmark. But I think for the, the general principle is that for sector that has uh, more homogeneous goods, uh, we will have few sectors, maybe for aluminum, we may have only one or two. Okay, thank you. So actually, uh, for me, I'm not very interested in to, to achieving very long term targets to, to reduce the carbon emission or say uh, carbon neutrality. So our relatively realistic targets to, to peak the emission by 2030, right? So, and our uh, street speakers also talk about from the uh, uh, demand side from the supply side and from the uh, ETS system perspective. So I, I would like to, to, to get your uh, insight, your thought. How do you think to, to, achieve, to achieve this uh, the peak, uh, carbon peak by 2030? What is the most important thing that the Chinese government needs to do? From the, needs to, to improve the technology or in, uh, to decide this, uh, the policy or, or to, to, uh, to build up or to construct this uh, ETS in a, in a even faster way in order to to make this uh, this this system function well. Uh, how do you think? Uh, uh, I, I hope I hope this question you can you can okay, give me some since, ideas. Since, I, since I'm not uh, muted, uh, I will just mm -hmm. start first and. I think this, this is a great question. And for me personally, I'm also extremely interested in um, like studies that related to some uh, real impacts of the emission reduction uh, in China and the world. And uh, well, this is just a uh, hope. Um, uh, that's this question that, or the issue that you raised it was also related to some of the questions that uh, are presented uh, uh, here in the uh, chat box. Um, so for example, I think one important thing for, uh, for some uh, market-based instruments uh, to be really effective uh, in China and other developing worlds is a very effective uh, MRV system uh, to measure the uh, CO2 emissions uh, uh, faithfully and accurately. Uh, well, this is actually a very uh, challenging task and we have been doing some study on this issue um, so we really hope there could be a mechanism that 
uh, incentivize, um, for example, verifiers and government uh, to diligently measure the emissions of the firms. Uh, and also now I think the Chinese government is considering uh, some more advanced technologies uh, to hopefully automatically uh, accurately measure the uh, the CO2 emissions like the uh, the uh, continuous emission uh, measuring system that have been already deployed for uh, traditional air and water pollutants. Uh, but for CO2, uh, it is more challenging because that's a, that's the flow uh, or the stock pollutant, not the, uh, uh, the the conventional pollutant that you only care about the concentration level. Uh, but we, we believe that could be some uh, good technology solutions uh, to achieve uh, or help this uh, policy instrument that we are working on to, to be really effective. Um, yes. Can I jump in? Yeah, since I mostly focus on the, um, the consumer side, so I, I think I can speak in terms of uh, look at con consumer heterogeneity and distributional impact. So the first aspect of it is uh, in terms of the distributional impacts so when energy prices increase, I think uh, even though we're looking at from efficiency, what are the policies that can achieve uh, emissions at the lowest cost? Uh, but however, I think that does have distributional impact. For example, higher prices might have disproportional burden for the lower income households. Uh, the recent paper that I published at uh, Nature Energy, even though it's in the US context, but in China, when you also, for example, you have higher prices or when you have a higher air pollution, then that will cause lower, lower income households that might uh, uh, have higher burden of their energy expenditure increase. So I think one thing that the policymakers should consider is not only about efficiency or achieve uh, lower emissions, but also the distribution you know, impact or disproportional impact on the most vulnerable group. And the second is in terms of consumer heterogeneity and then what exactly are the market failures that we're, we're talking about. Um, so I think, uh, of course, we have the negative externalities that are causing for example, the overuse of fossil fuel and carbon uh, emissions. But then we should also look at some other type of market failure, such as information asymmetry or uh, cognitive constraint, and that might be heterogeneous across different consumers. And then uh, for, to directly deal with those type of externalities, then having an ETAs program or having a carbon pricing may not actually be the most efficient solution. So I think policymakers should also, uh, not only, uh, of course, having ETAs is great, but also have in mind that there's this huge consumer heterogeneity and these other market failures, and we should, use combination of uh, policy instruments. And then the nudging, which I talked about earlier today, uh, can be uh, a good uh, option to target at market failure, such as information asymmetry. Right, thanks. Yeah. And Gang, would you like to also share something? Uh, I want to echo what uh, Professor mm -hmm. Zhang and uh, Professor Chu uh, mentioned. Uh, and uh, to add a note on that, uh, yeah. the, the just uh, transition is very important uh, during this process. Uh, first, let's say if we have to phase out the coal, uh, the people who uh, work in the coal industry and uh, along the coal value chain would be uh, heavily impacted. Uh, currently, we have about 3 million uh, co workers in the co industry, uh, plus about uh, half a million people working in the co power industry. Uh, that means 3.5 million uh, workers will be impacted by uh, this ch transition. And how we, um, because each worker they have a family to support, so how we uh, sustain their uh, livelihood and other aspect of their um, mentality and other uh, uh, health perspective, uh, those are all uh, very important. One other related in the uh, cons consumption side is uh, some poor communities still uh, rely on coal for their uh, cooking, heating, and uh, now we, we you know we have some discussions on the uh, replacing their co use to use net more uh, more expensive natural gas and even electricity. Uh, those with good intention, but at the same time we have to guarantee uh, they have energy supply and energy is uh, in some sense it's a human rights and it's it's there. Uh, they have the right to use energy to uh, support their. 
uh, life. So those um, uh, other disadvantaged population along the uh, transition really uh, need our attention and uh, we have to create a policy mechanisms to address their need. Uh, without that, uh, we cannot uh, you know, create a more stable transition or more sustainable transition uh, in the process. That's what uh, we hope to uh, discuss more in the future. And uh, uh, that's very often uh, not necessarily ignored, but uh, uh, maybe under uh, uh, discussed in the current uh, uh, policy uh, discussion. Okay, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, this session will have to uh, stop due to the time limits. And uh, thank you again for your question and thank you again for the uh, uh, talks from uh, all these uh, three excellent speakers. Uh, I, I hope this was a good uh, session for you as it was for us. Uh, if you have any further questions, of course, you can uh, send, always send emails to uh, our distinguished speakers. Uh, you can find the email address from the uh, IAE website and thank you again uh, for IAE to hosting this webinar. So I would like to hand over to Rebecca and she will give a final concluding remark for our webinar. IAE wishes to thank Dr. Lin Jing for an outstanding webinar. Uh, this webinar will be available on IAEE's website for future download. If you're not a member of IAEE, we encourage you to join by visiting www.iaee.org. We thank you for attending, and I now officially close this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.